I'd like to welcome everybody and thank you for tuning in tonight. Um, we've got Lisa Shibley with us uh, with Manomet's uh, International Shorebird Survey, and she's going to enlighten us on how all of us can help uh, and get involved in this um, citizen science project, which uh, I won't give away too much because Lisa's going to tell us all about it, but it's uh, it's worth doing. It's a lot of fun. Um, Lisa is a, a friend of ours that uh, we've worked together in a couple times. You may recognize her face as one of the original uh, women in step from our uh, 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 Champions of the Flyway team that almost made it to Israel two years ago or, and then had to bow out the last second and then did again this last year, although Lisa didn't join last minute, um, sadly. Maybe sadly. next year, you're going to... You can try, try again. Until I get there. <laughs> yeah, perfect. Yeah, the fates were, you know, conspiring against us there. Um, but despite that women in step, of course, uh, if you don't know the story, uh, you can check it out on our, on the Champions of the Flyway Festival, hugely successful, uh, won every award they gave that year um, for their great work towards conservation um, and, and money raising and, uh, their great energy and spirit in doing so. So um, looks like we've got everyone in. Uh, with no further ado, I'm going to turn this over to you, Lisa, and have you talk to us about uh, the International Shorebird Survey. Uh, just so folks know, we'll take questions, uh, do some Q&A at the end with the questions, and um, Q&A box should be highlighted on the bottom of your screen so that you can um, type in a question there. If not, you can always put it in chat as well. We'll be checking both. And um, Lisa, please take it away. Okay, great. First things first, let me share my screen. All right. And I will silence myself. All right. Did that work? You're there. Awesome. Okay. Hey, everyone. Uh, thank you so much, Jeff, for the kind invitation for ask me to chat with y'all about Manomet and the International Shorebird Survey. Before I get started, I did wanna, uh, I did wanna give a shout out to Jeff and his amazing digiscoping. I have been, I've done a little digiscoping on my own and I, uh, this is probably one of my favorite images um, that I was able to catch, capture digiscoping, but I, follow Jeff on Facebook and I see all of his amazing stuff he does. So I wanted to say that the next time we happen to be in the same place, I hope I get some lessons because I definitely need them. Anyway, I'm Lisa Shibley. So I'm the North American coordinator for the International Shorebird Survey and also known as ISS. And the first thing that I want y'all to know about me is that I love shorebirds. Um, the, there's, there's so much to love about them. They, their epic migration and their tricky identification. I love the fact that they're not straightforward. I remember the very first time that I was able to pick out a white, a white uh, rump sandpiper from a flock of peeps, and I still remember how excited I was. Um, I love their behaviors, the, the, the big flocks, the, the fact that they're, they occupy our favorite spaces. I mean, who doesn't love going to a beach? And of course, they're the cutest little babies. Those little fluff balls with two toothpicks are definitely the, some of the cutest babies on the planet. So um, I love shorebirds and I'm really excited to talk about them and ISS with you guys a little bit. So the first thing I wanted to talk a little bit about is Mammoth because some folks might not be familiar with with us, we're a nonprofit, a conservation nonprofit, and I've been working at Manomet since 2008 with uh, different shorebird uh, scientists, I, supporting shorebird scientists. And um, Manomet started in 1969 as the Manomet Bird Observatory. Uh, so that's 53 years ago. It started as a banding lab, and they've been uh, continuously for 53 years, uh, capturing and banding and releasing uh, passerines from 50 different nets. So it's one of the oldest continuous uh, banding operations in North America. Uh, and um, 
once they had established that, it started to branch out into a lot of different uh, endeavors. And one of the main ones is shorebirds. So Manomet shorebirds work focuses on using science and collaboration to identify critical sites for shorebirds across their flyways. Um, we collaborate with a diverse set of partners across the hemisphere from rice farmers in Louisiana to salt producers in Ecuador and echo tour leads leaders in Georgia. And we're all working together to identifying threats to shorebirds to um, work on alleviating pressure on their habitats uh, and sensitive ecosystems while working to ensure that the human communities that surround uh, the shorebird habitats continue to thrive. And ISS contributes data to all of these endeavors. So why are we interested in shorebirds? Um, there's, the shorebirds are, we know that the bird populations across the globe are decreasing, you know, all, any birder who goes to their patches will see over time that there are certain species that you just don't see anymore. You don't see them in the same numbers. And in the studies that look at these trends, shorebirds are one of the one of the families of birds that are decreasing at the highest rate. So obviously we need to figure out what's going on there. But also um, shorebirds are excellent indicators for important habitats. So not just not just beaches, but also grasslands and wetlands, they can tell us what's going on with these systems. They, they're, because they, their migration spans so much area, um, we need to understand their life cycle at each portion. We need to know what's going on in the Arctic, what's going on on migration, what's going on in their wintering grounds. Um, their threats are very complex, so what's, what's threatening them in the Arctic is gonna be different than what's threatening them in South America. So all of that means that we need a very robust way to gather information around them, about them. And the International Shorebird is one of those ways, uh, International Shorebird Survey is one of those ways. Um, the, the goal has always been to, um, to create estimations for popula population sizes and trends of migratory shorebirds. ISS focuses on migratory shorebirds. Um, we also are interested in identifying important stopover sites. Um, we use our data to support local partners for management and conservation. And we also, a very important component of ISS has always been recruiting citizen scientists who care about shorebirds so that we can build a shorebird conservation constituency people who are shorebird enthusiasts who can contribute to the well-being of shorebirds. And I do get a question um, a lot of times is, you know, where does ISS fit into some of these other monitoring schemes that you've probably heard of? So there's, you know, everybody knows about the Christmas bird counts and the breeding bird surveys. Um, there are, you know, MSP, which is uh, point blue on the, the Pacific Flyway does winter surveys. Um, you've probably heard of uh, the satellite tracking that we do. So these are all different ways, and Manamet is involved in, in all of these, different ways of looking at shorebirds and gathering information about their populations. Um, so it's kind of, I always say, it's kind of like the carpenter that measures twice and cuts once. You're just you want different ways of gathering this information so you can have robust model and robust understanding. So Brian Harrington um, started ISS in 1974. And so he was thinking about all of these very important questions about shorebird migration and populations. And the, the shorebirds that he were interested in are, are these migrants. They're the ones that nest in the high Arctic and they, migrate through their flyways and they spend their summer or spend their winter in the summer of South America. So the problem is, is that especially when he started, 
there wasn't a lot of access to these places. There was, wasn't a, lot, a great way to spend a lot of time up in the Arctic, and there wasn't a, there wasn't a lot of access to some of these wintering grounds in, in South America. So he was trying to figure out how to make, how to estimate these populations with the, with, through their migration. And so he came up with the idea of enlisting volunteers all across the flyways to, who love shorebirds and have sh places that shorebirds use nearby. And they visit, he asked them, he, he asked them to visit spots regularly and count their birds and sent him the results. And it all evolved into Manomet's International Shorebird Survey, which is actually one of the longest running citizen science projects in the world. So just a little history. Uh, as I mentioned, Brian Harrington started uh, in 1974. And by, by 1980, he actually already had over a hundred volunteers sending in 2000 surveys. So he already was gathering robust data. And as, as the years went by, he had more and more volunteers sending in more data. And we hit a hundred thousand surveys in 2019. So it's, it's, he kept up that momentum across the decades. And we originally, we had all of this data coming into Manomet on paper sheets. So if you look at the slide on the left-hand side, you actually can see one of the original paper sheets. So these were sent to him from, you know, from Maine to Florida, from Central America, from South America. He would gather them in and put them into his computer, and then he would run his studies on, run his models on that. But now, of course, in uh, 2006, we transferred it to eBird. So that saves a lot of work. And that helps us recruit more because it doesn't take as much, it doesn't take as much paperwork to get the surveys in. So that has helped ISS continue to grow. Um, just a, a, this is a map that shows all of the ISS sites in the US and Canada. And in 2021, we had, in the US and Canada, we had 259 contributors across 531 sites. And they sent us, for one year, they sent us 3,294 surveys. And in Latin America, so this includes Central America and South America, the number of um, contributors and sites and surveys are similar in 2021. And I wanted to point out the, the graph at the bottom shows how recently we've had a lot more coverage in Latin America than we, we had, say, a decade ago. And that's because um, my colleague Arne Leisterhouse has been uh, working very hard to recruit ISS contributors in South and Central America. So he um, has been running workshops and has a huge in interest in in uh, ISS, and he also has been working hard to help get some of these shorebird enthusiasts access to optics, which can be a little tricky in South America. Um, so he's been doing a great job, as you can see by that red line. All right, so the next thing I wanted to talk to you is a bit, little bit about how the data that the shorebird enthusiasts collect, the, the ISS contributors collect, how it is, is it actually used by shorebird scientists? So this is an example of a, of a map that was created by Paul Smith. Now, Paul Smith is a scientist at the Environment and Canada, uh, Climate Change Canada. Um, and he has been working with ISS data for more than a decade now. And he's produced quite a number of papers that basically show regional patterns and also hemispheric trends using ISS data. And this is an example of the white rump sandpiper, which I mentioned earlier. As uh, the data has, the data shows the trends in the Northeast. So if you look at the map, the blue means that 
the trend is negative. Red means the trend is positive. Uh, sorry, not positive, but is more negative. I said that wrong, sorry. So there, the white rum sandpiper is decreasing, but it's not decreasing as fast in New England as it is in Canada. And so that's something that he actually discovered with the ISS data. And that's something that, you know, helps the conservation managers, you know, direct their efforts to figuring out what's going on. So this is, this is, um, this is a snapshot that he produced, um, you know, maybe five or six years ago. And he has a new paper coming out. It's going to be some, sometime in the next year that has uh, more recent summaries and it, and it shows what declines have been happening for which shorebirds over the past 10 years or so. Um, so that's the most update, that's going to be the most updated that we have for shorebird trends and population. So the another, another place where ISS was used is in the 3 billion bird study. And so that study came out in 2019 and it combined the, the, the trends that ISS shows with current estimations of populations. And it showed that a 3 billion birds have been lost from North America over the last 50 years. The, um, the primary authors were from Cornell and American Bird Conservancy and the wildlife agencies of the US and Canada. And for the most species, for most species, for most families of birds, they used uh, the breeding bird surveys and the Christmas bird counts as their primary source of data. But for 20 species of shorebirds, for the same reason that we already talked about, that the Christmas bird counts, there are not that many Christmas bird counts where these migration shorebirds spend their winter. And there's not that many breeding bird surveys that happen in the Arctic where they, they, they're breeding. So they needed the ISS data for their numbers to, um, to, for them to be able to get their numbers for the shorebird family. Uh, so we actually got a little footnote in the study. We were very excited about that. And the, so the 3 billion bird study, um, really, I, I'm imagining that most folks have, have heard of it because it was one of the most shared story, scientific stories of 2019. Um, it, I, they recorded, or they had 1,800 print media articles about it, and 4 billion people apparently um, the information was distributed to. So it was a very impactful study. But one of the things that I loved about it is that it wasn't just negative. They used the numbers that they got from the waterfowl and the raptors to show that because of the, cons the concerted effort that the conservation um, folks have put into waterfall and raptors, those families are actually doing well, doing better. They're increasing their population. And so that's an example of why it's important to keep all of these conservation efforts going. And they also, um, they also had as part of their, as part of what they did um, as part of the campaign was seven simple actions that every person can take to help the birds. And uh, number seven was to do citizen science projects like ISS. So it's a big cycle. If you do the, I, if you do ISS, you're gonna help these studies and they're gonna understand what is going on with the birds. So another, another use of ISS is WISERN. WISERN is the Western Hemisphere Shorebird Reserve Network. And that is something also that was started at Manomet many, uh, several decades ago in 1985. And it is a system, a network of sites that are important for shorebirds that the managers of the sites, the owners of the sites commit to taking account shorebirds in their management plans. And you, they use ISS to identify these, these sites. And then they, they continue to track the ISS to see 
you know, what results their management plans are attaining. So that's another, another use for ISS data. And then there's lots of examples of local researchers, local scientists, and conservation partners that use ISS, ISS data in management plans and um, uh, local studies for state agencies. There's also ISS is used in national shorebird plans for Ecuador, Colombia, Argentina, Peru, and Brazil, and also the United States has a shorebird plan. So all of these, all of these documents that help bring together who want help bring people together who want to figure out how to help the shorebirds that all uses ISS. So those are the examples of the kinds of programs that will use ISS data for the benefit of shorebirds. And then there's also another big reason why ISS is important. And that's because ISS builds a shorebird constituency. So the ISS, um, from the beginning, that Brian Harrington knew that shorebirds often inspire a particular passion in people. It's, it's the shorebirds show up in these places that the that people love. You know, you go to the beach and the shorebirds are there, and they're, you know, they're they give us connection to the to the birds and to the beach, and they inspire this passion. And and you know, Brian knew that, and knew that it wouldn't take much encouragement for those folks to take that passion and and put it into dedication of, of becoming a citizen science and conducting these surveys. And we have individuals that he originally recruited, recruited when he first started the program. And they, they sent in their records, their surveys for decades. You know, they've submitted hundreds, even a few have submitted thousands of surveys. And we have to say how grateful we are for all of those volunteers um, because ISS would not be possible without it, obviously. So we are always looking for shorebird enthusiasts to become ISS contributors. Um, we reach out to, we reach out to a lot of different folks to, um, become ISS contributors in a lot of different ways. We, um, we talk with a lot of with the bird clubs. We reach out to, you know, in, to states and state wildlife agencies looking for it while they're running whatever their biology wildlife programs are, could they also submit some ISS data to us? We get a lot of, a lot of data that way, so that's great. Um, we've visited, uh, festivals, um, uh, I'm hoping to go to Texas in, um, November to do the Rio Grande Valley Bird Festival because Texas is one of the places where we actually need more coverage. In fact, we just hired a new biologist down there. Her name is Sam Wolf. So we're hoping that uh, we get a lot more coverage in Texas over the next decade. I actually meant to point that out when I had the slide of North America that we had a very strong um, ISS presence in the East Coast and the Midwest and somewhat the Great Plains, but we need, there's a little bit of a hole in Texas and there's also a little bit of light coverage in the Pacific Flyway. So, like I said, we just, Manamet just hired uh, Sam Wolf as a biologist for Texas. She has a whole bunch of responsibilities having to do with shorebirds, but ISS is one of them. And we're also starting to work with MSP, be, who does, uh, sorry, Point Blue, who does the um, Migratory Shorebird Project. And that's mostly a winter survey, but we're hoping to work together on, on um, 
finding folks who would be also interested in doing the migratory survey for ISS. So the, um, we also try to share ISS through you know, birding journals and Manomet publishes a magazine. So we're always looking for different way to reach folks who love shorebirds. We host workshops. Um, the image on the left is a workshop that Manomet did in um, Puerto Rico. And you know we have flyers. So if anybody on the call is part of a, a bird club or an Audubon chapter or a friends group for a national wildlife refuge, anything like that, you know, we'd love to talk to talk to your group about ISS and um, what uh, you know it, what we always um, we are always looking for more recruits. We also have a newsletter that goes out. goes up twice a year and we do site highlights and we always have little um, little identification pieces because you know one of the things that's most fun about shorebirds is how tricky the identification is. We, uh, we you know, I have an example of a little peep graphic that we put together and um, we also have information like this is something that we put together for uh, flag shorebirds. We know that the, the folks who are counting shorebirds, you know, they love, we love when we find the flag shorebirds too, so we can send those in. That's another source of shorebird data that I had listed on the first, on the slide earlier. So we wanted to make sure that all of our ISS contributors do exactly how to report those flags, even though it's not our project, but we want, we want them reported. All data is good data. Um, so that's another example of something that you'll see in the newsletter if you're a shorebird um, ISS contributor. Of course, our favorite thing that we do in the newsletter is highlighting our volunteers. Um, we all we sometimes they're volunteers who have done ISS forever and ever and ever. Sometimes they're volunteers who seem particularly enthusiastic. That but we always make sure that. We tell some stories uh, about what makes an, a volunteer interested in being a volunteer, and and uh, always try to always try to have fun with that because we love our volunteers so much. One of the uh, tools that we use in ISS is called the um, the mapping tool, the ISS mapping tool, and. Uh, we originally developed this tool with shorebird scientists in, in mind. We wanted them to, we wanted anybody to have access to this ISS data. We wanted it to be easy and downloadable and sortable in whatever ways you wanted, the scientists wanted, but we realized very quickly that this is something that will help our contributors as well. We wanted to, um, we wanted to make sure that everybody has access to this data so that you can um, you can check out and see what other ISS data is coming in near you. You can see if, you know, if this ISS has been going on for almost 50 years, there's going to be folks who have contributed data at your site maybe 50 years ago that you don't know about. So you can find that on the ISS tool. And, um, and, you know, we're really proud of that. We're, we're excited that this data is available for everybody. So the mapping tool, uh, it, it, you know, you can select whatever data you're looking at and you can, you see it sorted by the species and then you actually can drill down in this mapping tool straight to the eBird checklist that it was originally um, sent in on so that you can see you know, comments are, are um, more than just the numbers for every ISS uh, survey that's been, that's been done. So we, we, uh, we're very excited about this tool. So let's say that you're interested in becoming an ISS contributor. So what do you do? It's very easy. All you do is pretty much go birding and count shorebirds. We do ask, that anybody who um, is interested 
um, goes to the website and reads the basic protocols. And I have a little QR code at the end that you can do that very easily, but you can find it just by going to the manomet.org website and it's listed under ISS, under International Shorebird Survey. But the basics are, um, we're looking for migration data. So that means spring, that means fall. And we're looking for three times a season. That's what really helps our models. More is great. We love, you know, every 10 days, something like that. But we do ask for at least three times a season. And repeatability is really key. We, if you are in, if you have a, a beach site that you want to go to, and the shorebirds generally collect in different ways at high tide than low tide, we want you to collect the data at the same time. So whether it's high tide, whether it's low tide, but always the same time. So if you cover the same area, you think about your area and you wanna cover it in the same way, then you wanna cover it in about the same amount of time. It doesn't have to be exact, you know, but you don't wanna cover it in five minutes one time and three hours another time. The whole idea is to keep everything the same. And then, um, you know, in the same way. So if you're, if you walk the beach one day, then you should, you know, you don't want to just drive to the end and cover it that way. It's all, it's the idea is you cover the same area in the same time in the same way. Um, you count all the shorebirds at your site. You know, we love eBirds, so we want you to put everything into eBird, but for ISS, we, you need to count all the shorebirds at your site. And uh, we definitely want you to practice your estimation skills. Um, we have a great, web, a great webinar that Abby Sterling and Monica Iglesia did a few years ago that is a, 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 a very nice presentation on how to estimate shorebird flocks. So that's on the Manomet YouTube play. YouTube page. I always talk about that. Um, uh, but you have to, I don't have a link to that. You have to go Google it or something. But that's that's a great way to practice how to estimate a flock. A flock. Um, but we don't expect you to count everything, every single shorebird if it's like 500 shorebirds. But a good estimation is always important. And also be conservative about identification. So there's no reason why you can't just say, okay, that's a Dowager Spa. I'm happy with the Dowager Spa. That, that works for us. Um, so we always say, when in doubt, peep spa is fine. Um, we also, we tell our contributors, you know your site best. You know, you know when the shorebirds are there. You know, you know where to go to find them. We don't tell you how to cover your site. As long as you're covering your site, in the same way, about the same um, time. That's the data that we want. Um, and then how do you submit your data? Very easy, you, just like any other eBird checklist. You start your checklist, you count your shorebirds, you put them in, and then you, after you stop your checklist under on that drop-down list, I have it right here, instead of traveling stationary or incidental, you hit International Shorebird Survey and you hit submit and that's that that's it. Although there is, there is, I said that's it, but this actually changed. Last year, Cornell um, implemented some new uh, variables for us to collect. And we're really excited about this. They actually used ISS as their test case. So eventually, or any, any, protocol can now have um, custom variables to collect in eBird. I'm not sure if they're implementing that yet, but that is the plan. So we came up with four, wind, precipitation, survey area, and tidal stage. Those are what we ask our um, contributors to collect. The survey area is probably the most important one, and it's also the one that I've had to explain the most because it basically says, did you collect your data in the same way as you have all the previous times? Or did something happen? You know, was there a thunderstorm that chased you off the beach? Or did, um, 
was a road closed. So you could actually not get to the last, you know, last little bit of your site. So we still, you know, interested in you sending in the data in whatever way you can, but we want that number to kind of say, okay, you know, I couldn't quite get to the last 10% of my site. So I'm going to say my surveyed area was 90%. And that's, you know, once you hit submit, then your data gets sent into eBird and then we bring it into our database. And then it shows up on the ISS map. So that's, that's it. That's all you need to do to become an ISS contributor. So um, for more information, that's the, that's the ISS uh, website. And we have, um, we have coordinators for Brazil, North America, that's me, and Latin America, that's Arne. So I'm going to put this screen on because that little QR code will take you to the website. So that is my presentation about ISS. And I did see that there were a few um, questions. I'm gonna unshare my screen, but I can always go back if I need to answer anything. All right, I think I did it. You did it. You did do it. We are okay. all so much smarter than we were uh, on that. Also, if anybody has any questions about ISS data, I can share my screen with the mapping tool on it. And I would be happy to show any questions or answer any questions about ISS data using the mapping tool. I've done that Ooh. on other uh, webinars and it seemed to work pretty well. All right, well, let's, uh, you wanna tackle the questions first or you give us a little example of that first? Totally up to you. Let's let's start with questions, and then if right. any questions involve data, I'll just switch over. All right. So Kevin Chrisman, he's a, a friend of ours. He helps us with the Florida Keys Hawk Watch, which we sponsor. I know Kevin. He yeah. asked me about ISS. Right. So he's asking uh, if you also partner with any of the following projects: the Gulf of Mexico Avian Monitoring Network. So I actually have a American meeting program. with those folks next Friday. So I will be able to answer that question next Friday afternoon. <laughs> How about Pan American Shorebird Program Shorebird Marking Protocol? So that's the isn't that that's the um the slide that I showed that had the flagging information. Right. I believe. That's okay. that's the okay. that's the organization that decides what colors go to you know Central America is gray, you know United States is green. I believe so. So we're we don't. We don't put, well, Manomet does have lots of flagging programs, but ISS, which is what I do, we're not the folks that, I'm not the folks, folks that put the flags on the shorebirds, but we do encourage our, and it's fun too. Oh my gosh, it's so fun when it, you see a shorebird with a flag on it and you can mm -hmm. read it and you can, that's what you need the COA scope for, yeah. is to get those shorebird flags. scoping has helped a lot with me not transcribing, yes. you know, Try yeah. transcribing that wrong, but yeah. Usually, yeah. what what I do is I when I'm looking at it and I the first thing I do is put a um, record my voice, and so I'm reading reading the numbers out loud. Okay, it's an A. No, it's not an A. It's a P. You know, yeah. but I get it. I get it recorded, and then I work on the picture because because. Right. You know, I never have a pen in right. the field. <laughs> or you drop it in the sand. As a yeah, cover. yeah. Um, he also asked about uh, Atlantic Flyway Disturbance Project, if you're cooperating with them as well. I don't know if that one. Yeah, that's that's man, That's part of the um, uh, Atlantic Flyway. Um, it used to be called the Atlantic Flyway Business Plan. I think it's now the Atlantic Flyway Conservation Initiative. So okay. Manomet was part of the team that put that together. Um, and I think they're, you know, looking to NIFWF to, for funding and, and ISS is all absolutely part of um, what they use to decide what sites are important and, and things like that. Mm -hmm. All right. Um... Yvonne's asked here, uh, 
if you also incorporate data from the Pacific Shorebird Survey uh, with Point Blue, and I think that that was one of the projects that you actually also highlighted yep. Octagon, right, or whatever it was. Yep, that was in the Octagon, and uh, I we have had meetings with Matt Ryder, who is uh, you know the lead of MSP, I think the Migratory Shorebird Project, which is uh, Point Blue. So Manomet, um cooperates with Point Blue on a lot of Pacific Flyway um, monitoring programs. And our, our partners and staff are their partners. Um, so, so yes, we do coordinate with them. It doesn't go into the same database though. So their data is, um, Yvonne, I hope you can correct me if I'm incorrect. Um, I believe is very focused on winter data. So they're interested in mostly where are the shorebirds spending their winter? So I think it's either a January or a February survey and it's done in a short window. So there's not, there's not gonna be a lot of moving around and it's a, it's, a, it's a great protocol. It's a really good snapshot of what the population looks like on that in, that, in those two weeks because you're not going to have that much turnover. Right. So and that's Yvonne, Sorry, Yvonne did um, yeah. agree that yeah, that's exactly right. So. so it doesn't go into the same database. You know, they have their database and we have our database. But so if if a scientist is interested in understanding bird pop, you know, populations of the of a particular shorebird, they'll look at both and they'll see, you know, okay, what is this saying? What is that saying? Um what are the differences? How does that make us understand? Okay. Um, here's a couple other good ones for you. Um, Peggy asked, uh, can you give the contact information? We can get you to do a program. That would be just reach out to you, correct? Yep. You so you? let me, um, can I, yeah, I can do everything. So I'm just going to put my email right in here. And um, sorry, looking at the screen. Yeah, no worries. And and then okay. so yeah, so so that's a lot of what I do is is trying to so I do both recruitment, trying to find new ISS coordinators, but I also do the database management. So so I help develop the mapping tool. Um, I I I I play with the data. I make sure it's available to the scientists. Send you know send out reports, things like that. The the folks with the the PhDs, they're the ones that do the <laughs> they're the ones that do the models and the write the papers. But yeah. I just I make sure that their data is what they need what they need. You do. But the then I also stuff. present about ISS to try to get the um, get enough um, increase our numbers, get our increase our coverage. So we're always looking for new shorebird enthusiasts. Um. And would I be correct if they were to forget or lose this, that uh, if they reach out, say, through your Facebook page, the yep, ISS I'm Facebook on Facebook page, and on you, Twitter. They find you, right? Okay. Yep. So through so social media as well as a backup. Um, let's see. Natasha asked, uh, are there plans to merge databases with Point Blue? I think you kind of addressed that a little bit already, that probably with two separate organizations, they want to keep their data separate a little bit but work together that'd be my yeah idea. no we definitely definitely work together and yeah. um no there's not really a plan to merge them just because they they they're both set up so that they're easy access and um i guess i guess it's all accessible anyway yeah it's all accessible gotcha um all right uh, Kevin, let's see, asked again, uh, can more than one person survey the same beach? That's uh, a great question. You know, can one person cover it on weekends, someone else cover it during the middle of the week? It's, it's not, yeah, absolutely, you could, because you, we would want, we would want to make sure that you were communicating, because we wouldn't want one person to only go at low tide and one person to go at high tide, if it was a beach, mm -hmm. or... Um, you know, we would want to make sure that, um, 
I guess this is the only reason, only answer that I can think of. But we would want to make sure that it was done the same way, uh, where every time it's done. So, you know, we've had people who do a beach for two or three years, and then another person does for two or three years, and we always say, "Oh, do you happen to know this person? Can you reach out and say, oh, did you, you know, did you cover this section of the beach or just this section of the beach?" We also have this is really exciting. We're gonna add a piece of the mapping tool where someone can, will be able to actually draw a polygon on the mapping tool around the site that they cover. So if you walk to this point, but you don't go around this bend, so you don't ever count the shorebirds that are there, you'll actually be able to draw that polygon so that that's gonna be stored in the database as well. So in the future, so let's say you know you cover your beach and then you move away and then no one covers that beach for five years, in and someone is interested in covering that beach. All of a sudden you can you can contact us and we'll send you that polygon and you'll know exactly what was covered originally. Oh, that's and really we do cool. have polygons. When it was originally established, we did ask by hand all of the folks to describe what they're covering in their site and send them in. And so we actually have all of that information, but at some point we stopped gathering it. So we're starting again. So we mm -hmm. do have this gap in data, but we're gonna be starting that again um, once that tool is added to the, to the mapping tool. Oh, that'd be really cool. I mean, obviously eliminating as many variables as possible is key in any of these monitoring programs. Um, you know, I'm more of a hawk watcher, but it's the same thing. You know, we try yep. and yeah, the consistency as consistent as possible um, to make the data more meaningful. Um, and then Mary asks, and this is one that I can handle, she's just asking if COA has uh, digiscoping webinars available. And yes, Mary, we have, if you go to our YouTube channel, um, it's youtube.com uh, backslash user backslash COA Sporting Optics, or if you just go to YouTube and search for COA Sporting Optics, you'll come to our page. And we literally have, uh, I guess, probably 100 plus um, different webinars now. And this one will be hosted there as well, um, live in evergreen copy. Um, but yeah, we've got a handful of really good uh, digiscoping um, webinars, you know, uh, in particular phone scoping is one of the most popular ones. I did one last year, phone scoping uh, made simple. We did another one uh, the year before in conjunction with phone scope. Uh, and their rep, which was really fun. So yeah, there's there's a bunch of information there on, on digiscoping. We'll be doing more because we're constantly getting new COA scope owners and we need to revisit this. So um, keep an eye out in the near future for that. Um, let's see, Yvonne asks, uh, do, 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 do. we have seen count sites get developed so that the count changes radically. Have you had many count sites drop out? We definitely have. And the the... I have, I don't know how you, I, I know Jeff, you know Jim Danzabar, right? Is yep. that how you pronounce his name? Danzabaker. 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 Mm -hmm. Danzabaker. Yeah. Yep. So we, his father, who I also believe was also Jim Danzabaker, mm -hmm. was an ISS contributor back in like the 70s and the 80s. And right. we have this whole series of correspondence from him about a spot in New Jersey that he covered for years and years and years, and then they paved it over. And we have the final note that says, well, I'm not going to cover this site anymore because it doesn't exist. It happens. It absolutely yeah. happens. Yeah. And so the models take that into account. The models look at places that used to have ISS and don't have ISS anymore. And then they look at places that don't didn't have ISS and have ISS more. And, you know, one of these days I'll, I'll, I'll sit Paul Smith down. I'll say, okay, so exactly how does the math work? But right. it does, it does. They know how to take that into account and what right. that means. Um, and I also wanted to say, uh, Yvonne posted about the, um, the, the, the incoming tides, the, the Pacific shorebird survey, which is, uh, MSP, the migratory shorebird project. I think that's kind of, one and, and the other uh, has their contributors starting the count at a certain stage of the incoming time. And that absolutely completely makes sense. 
And I think that's because M uh, Point Blue has already defined the sites that they want to get data from. So these are sites that are, are well-defined, they've mapped all their polygons, they've, they've, um, they know that these sites are gonna be sites where the shorebirds are consistent and have consistent numbers on the incoming rising tide, which makes sense because actually most beach are just like that. Mm -hmm. But some, yes, and sim simultaneous. So, so that's how they get the really a really good count of total population. But there are some places where people see shorebirds that aren't going to be good at rising tides. You know, they are, they only are uncovered at at a, at a low tide. And like I actually have one of those. One of my Ellisville, my Ellisville ISS site. Uh, up here in Massachusetts is is really good at a low tide. That's the only time it's good, but it's so juicy they love it. Yep. Um, and so if I were doing an ISS site at a rising high tide, it would be covered. So that's why we say so. It's a it's just a slightly different protocol. We we say you you know your sites best. We're not defining the sites. You are. You know you know you. Pay attention to your shorebirds. You know when they show up. You know when they leave. Um, under what circumstances? So, you, as long as you're consistent, as long as each time you visit your site, you visit it at the same tide, whether high or low, that's what we want. That's what we care about. Right. Um, no, that's really good stuff. Uh, did you want to uh, show us some of the mapping tool? Sure. Just kind of how that works. That'd be awesome. Let's see if it works. Yeah. Okay, I think. I yeah, know um, to Kevin's point or with Kevin's situation, there's a great flat that I'm thinking about that's not far from the Florida Keys Hawk Watch in the Middle Keys. It's like that that is awesome at a lower tide, but it's it's just rocks, you know, uh, at high tide. There's no there's no uh, flat left. So uh, we can uh, we can look at. Um, am I sharing my map? Yep. We can look at Florida. So I'm selecting the United States. I'm selecting Florida. And then I'm going to select, I'm going to select all years. So norm, the normal default is past 10 years, but I'm going to change it so it's on all years. And then we're going to see what we get. And there it is. So these are all of the sites that's ever been uh, uh, ISS survey has ever been sent in from. The uh, little dots mean that they are technically, that they are eBird hotspots. So I know a really good shorebird site that I've been to a number of times down. I don't know where you're going. <laughs> but, <that one too. laughs> but I wonder who might have submitted this checklist. Mark Sunger. I know Mark. Mm -hmm. So, so you can see all of the IS data, but Boca Chica Beach is an excellent shorebird spot, but it's never really been covered with ISS. Um, 2022. So this year is the only time it's ever been covered by ISS. So we need, we definitely need to fill some of those holes. But I, I also see that part of the crowd, we've got a, one of our counters, um, Mariah from Florida Key Talk Watch is in here too. And, you know, they do daily surveys um, in Long Key State Park. And, uh, you know, they keep track of all the birds from the Hawk Watch at Curry Hammock State Park, which includes shorebirds. So I got a feeling you might see some more stuff from those guys. That would be awesome. They're doing it already. And it's just a matter of clicking another box, right? Yes. If they're submitting to eBird and yeah. they're not, there's not another protocol going under, then um, as long as they're doing it the same way each time, absolutely click ISS and that'll go right into our database. So this is one of the things that I wanted to show. This is why, see if it shows up. So I'm just doing the past 10 years. Actually, let me change that. I'm gonna do, <coughs> I'm going to do the past, say, five years. 
And while you're doing that, Kevin asked again, uh, so uh, he noticed he's looking at it um, and noted that uh, there's no blue pins gaps in the data for large sections. Does this mean no one's counting there? And yes. I'm assuming that's a yes. If there's, if Lack there's, um, yeah, I'm not, I, when I'm sharing my screen, okay, there's the chat. That's all right. I, I can. <laughs> I'll make sure we're not missing it. Right. So I understand. I understand what you're asking. Sorry, I, I didn't quite get the question. I just read it. Um, so yes, yeah, so the um, Gulf Coast Audubon uh, surveys ha are happening. In fact, originally they were set up with Manomet um, folks together uh, after, um, so it must have been it was 2009, 2010 that the the Gulf uh, oil spill happened. <coughs> Excuse me. The um, the Gulf Coast uh, surveys were set up then, I think. So they were actually set up originally with ISS protocol in mind, so they could be together. They could be submitted to both um, data sets, but that actually didn't happen. So. That's one of the things that the call is about next uh, Friday is to figure out how we can be more cooperative with what data is going where and how we can make sure that you know the partners, the conservation partners that need access to it can get access to it. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of really good Gulf Coast data that we just want to make sure that it, you know, people who are answering these big shorebird questions know what data is available. So that's really important. But what I, the one thing I was going to point out is that there's not a lot of Texas data. So you can actually see some, you know, some dots down here, but there's, there's not a lot. I know my friend Susan is one of the, she's on the call. She's, she's uh, one of our really good surveyors down there, but we, you know, Texas, Texas Gulf Coast is so important for shorebirds. That's why Manomet um, is, uh, is actually hiring someone to over, overlook a lot of shorebird work down there, but including recruiting for ISS. So, so she's Sam Wolf, she's really awesome. And she's on the, she's on the talk. I don't know if oh, hey, Sam. Sam's, <laughs> okay. Sam's with us. Hopefully, we'll, Sam will meet you, Jeff, at uh, Rio uh, Grand Valley. A birding festival. Perfect. Yeah, looking forward to it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, some of those areas, I mean, obviously, um, uh, you know, uh, near Corpus Christi and, you know, Anahuac and uh, the, the shorebird flats uh, in Bolivar flats are amazing, you know, yeah, so. Yep. Lot, and there's a lot of, a lot I of mean, that's work. a lot of the local, there's a lot of really good local work going down yeah. there. Um, ISS is just a way where the local work can happen and it could also feed into these, you know, these hemispheric data sets as well. There's really no reason why they can't be valuable for both. Yep, make them uh, available to the conservation partners. Let's see, do we have any other questions? No chat. Looks like that's about it. Uh, we're running just right at about an hour on the dot here. Um, I'm going to unshare my screen. Last call, maybe, for any questions. Uh, if not, hopefully um, you all learned something, and some of you will be reaching out to Lisa and joining her flock, as it were, of researchers and helping um, with the shorebird conservation. That's so important, uh, you know, to uh, to be able to have the, as you said, how did you describe the data? A, not rich, it was, uh, there was another word you used, a different adjective. What did I, use? <laughs> I don't know, I don't know, a, a, a large data set, right? Um, at any rate, uh, great talk. It was really cool uh, to hear exactly how this is used a little bit more. You know, I'm even familiar with it, but I learned a few things. So um, great to uh, hear about it. Great to see you again, Lisa. Thanks for taking the time tonight. and. Uh, 
once again, we'll be putting up uh, an evergreen copy of this. Uh, so we'll see. Um, you'll probably get uh, a lot more people. We generally have a lot more people that actually watch our YouTube videos than join us live even. So you might be in for it, hopefully. Well, I really had a lot of fun talking to everybody. I could talk about shorebirds all day. And uh, you guys had some really great questions and more data is always better. So I really appreciate the opportunity and, uh, and I'm definitely looking forward to getting that DigiScope lesson for sure. Okay, done, done. And I'll maybe even submit some checklists locally. Who knows? Ooh. Ooh. All right, thanks again. We're gonna sign out. Um, thanks again to all the people that joined us and keep an eye out. We'll be advertising uh, more uh, webinars uh, on a more frequent basis. Uh, so thanks for joining us once again and look forward to seeing you in the next one.